Amen. Well, church, thank you for getting out of your comfort zone today and sitting in a part of the church you never have seen before. And it's awesome. You guys did really good. Well, I, I need to share some news with you because I, over the last couple of weeks, we shared a need that we had at the church. We shared with you that in order for us to meet our financial obligations this fall, we needed your help for our ministries to thrive. Our treasurer had told us that we needed $200,000 between now and the end of the year if we're going to meet uh, the needs, the obligations of the Grove. And so we, we shared that need with you. And we, last, we asked last week if you would take this card and either make a gift on that day or commit to make a gift over the next five months. And our goal, like I said, was $200,000. So I need to share with you what, what has been given plus what is committed to come in over the next, what has been pledged over the next five months. And that amount we're going to put on the screen is $263,900. Thank you, Grove. That's a miracle. In the, in the, just when we felt overwhelmed, thank you so much, church. And, and if you were not here last week and you want to be a part of helping your church to thrive, these cards are on your seat. You can still be a part of this. Thank you, all of you who made a gift or have made a commitment to give. It's, it's going to make a huge, and it already is, making an incredible difference. Thank you, church. Well, before we get started, I, I need to introduce to you, we just our, some of our student athletes with Justice College just arrived on campus, our fall sport athletes, women's soccer, women's volleyball, men's soccer, and I need to introduce our whole women's volleyball team is sitting right here. Can you all stand? You guys have to stand. You got to stand. Chrissy Gus, Coach Santa. This is Coach Chrissy Gus. And our women's soccer, those in the back row stand. All right, never mind. Go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> Uh, but really good to have you guys back uh, back here. Also, by the way, I have a really good friend here, Don Pape. Don Pape has been a publisher for decades. He was my publisher when my first book, True Religion, came out. He published that along with my second book, um, God Can't Sleep. And so, Don, can we welcome Don Pape to the Grove? You got to wave, Don. Thank you, Don, for being here. Well, we're in this series, as Scott mentioned, that we've titled Gather at the Grove. And we're in the series talking about we gather to serve. We're going to talk about how we gather and go. We talked last week about how we gather to bless. Today, I want to talk about how when we gather, we grow. We grow spiritually through our gathering together. We're going to look at some educational principles today that remind us that we, we grow, we develop, we're influenced by the way we think and behave by the people closest to us. There's so much that we learn and know in life that we simply acquire because of the people that are close to us. There, there are some things that you've never taken a class for or studied, but you have an aptitude for because you've learned it from, from the people around you. For example, I have a friend who was at a wedding a few years ago, and he said he was sitting pretty close to the front, and he said he, he saw one of the groomsmen lock their knees, and he locked his knees, and you know what happens when you lock your knees is uh, all of a sudden this groomsman drops to the ground, and he's out cold. And so this friend of mine rushes up on stage and get, you know, sees if there's anything he can do. And just when he does that, two other individuals rush on stage. And one looks at the other and says, are you a doctor? And this first one says, yes, I'm a cardiologist. And so he says back, are you a doctor? He says, yes, I'm a neurologist. And then they looked at my friend and they said, are you a doctor? And this is his actual answer. He said, no, I'm not. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> And the guy's still out cold on the floor. Now, my point is there's a lot of things you can learn in life by observation and through watching others. Maybe being a medical doctor is not one of them. But, but a lot of life is like that. And here's the thing. When we think about growing spiritually, our spiritual development, we often think that our spiritual development is limited to primarily something that just happens in our mind. And... and and just something that, that if we read the right books or if we study the Bible enough or if we take a class or listen to a podcast, then that just grows our mind. But, and those are great and valid, essential ways that we grow spiritually. But our spiritual growth is not limited to what happens in our minds. It's just part of it. We also, as Americans, talk about 
how we have our personal spiritual growth. And we talk a lot about quiet times and personal Bible studies and personal prayer times and personal meditation. Those are all good and essential things. But again, that's only part of the way that we grow and develop spiritually. Today, I want to talk about how we grow spiritually and our faith matures through the relationships of the people that we are close to. In, edu- in the field of education, you have the fields of cognitive development, how we develop mentally. There's the field of moral development, how we develop in our character. There's also the field of social development. In other words, we develop and grow through the relationships that we have around us, the people closest to us. And in the same way, I want to remind you this morning that we grow spiritually through our godly relationships. Christian community, as we have here at The Grove, is a primary vehicle of our spiritual growth, of your spiritual growth. I have this key idea on the screen. I hope it kind of sticks with you today. In a world cluttered with hyper-connectivity, it becomes easy to not connect deeply at all. But relationships are intrinsically valuable to the Christian faith, and they become the fuel of our spiritual growth. And so I want to start with, with this idea this morning. I want to ask, in what ways then do we develop and grow through our relationships? And I'll start with this. That there are people in our lives that influence us. There are people in our lives that we are shaped spiritually because of the influence of the people that we do life with. We see this in the New Testament. So if you have a Bible, open up to Acts chapter 2. Or if you have your app or your, your iPhone, Acts chapter 2, open that up. I'm going to start at verse 42. They, and I'm reading from the Message Bible, they, the early Christians, committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together. We bolded that here because I really love that phrase for today, the life together. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. That's awesome. Every day their numbers grew, and God added to those numbers those who were being saved. So do you get the picture here that this early church was a place of connecting in Christian community. And that's my point here is that we are shaped spiritually by the people that we do life with. The problem is is that in the modern church or in the, I'll say the American church today, is that we miss that relationships are a primary means of our spiritual development. And I simply want to remind you today that the people that you spend your life with or your time with, the people around you, will shape who you are spiritually. All of us have people in our lives that influence us. Maybe it's consciously or subconsciously. Whether you like it or not, the people around you are influencing you. And these aren't just TikTok influencers. These are the people that either become, are your friends or your neighbors or your coworkers. The people you spend your time with will influence you. You see this maybe most clearly in, with high schoolers. If you've ever seen a group of high schoolers get together to go hang out on a Friday night, it seems like they've all shopped together or text each other because they're dressed alike and they've done their hair alike and they've, they're wearing the same outfit or clothes. It's just... Because we are influenced by the people around us. Think about this. After maybe 10 or 20 years of marriage, have you noticed husbands and wives start to look like each other? You know, they're in, some people start to look like their dogs. You know, that, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. And that has nothing to do with this message this morning. It's just an observation. <laughs> Educators have a principle called social learning theory. And the idea is that we learn from our relate, the relationships, the people, the, the, the social relationships that we keep around us. Albert Bandura was, a, about 50 years ago, was a, and he was there for a long time, was at Stanford as a psychologist. And he was one of the first to promote social learning theory, saying that much of what we know in life comes from the people who are around us. And then, for example, he says, children and adults exhibit 
an ability to do things that they were never trained in. For example, it, maybe you've never played baseball in your life. Maybe you've never held a baseball bat. But I bet that if somebody walked up and handed you a baseball bat, you would know what to do. Why? Because you've watched kids in Little League play baseball. You've watched enough baseball on TV to know what your stance should look like. The hardest thing in sports is to hit a, a, a fastball in baseball, but you may not be able to do that, but you know how to swing a bat. It's kind of the same thing if you have a flat tire. Maybe you've never had a class on changing a flat tire, but you've watched your mother or your father change flat tires, so you know how to change a flat tire. It's exactly what was happening in a Christmas story. Remember this? Mom said they have a flat tire. Mom says to Ralphie, get out of the car and help your dad. Well, what she's saying is go watch your dad and you'll learn how to change a tire. Unfortunately, he spills all the bolts and his dad swears and cusses. And so all he learns is a few swear words. So that didn't go quite how it should, but that's the point. You learn from the people around you as you watch them and interact with them. And I share that to say that it's the same way spiritually. A Christian educators or like Lawrence Richards or Larry Richards have written widely on the idea that, that as Christians, we are influenced and our spirituality matures through the influence of the people near us. If you think about it, we become imitators in a way of the people that we're close to. Students often want to dress like and look like and be like their youth pastor. Maybe you've heard it said that you are the sum of your friends. There's this great line in Acts 2, we'll put it on the screen, verse 47, we read, people in general liked what they saw. Again, there's an educational principle here. They liked what they saw, and the principle is this. It's called observational learning theory. That's a lot, it's a, a, a kind of a complicated way to say that by watching others, what we see others do, we learn from it. By observing and imitating the acts of others, it shapes who we are. There is, like I said when we first started, so much of what you know in life did not come from a classroom, did not come from reading a book. It came from watching people around you. For example, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about helping a church in South Florida, Homestead, Florida, after a hurricane. And when we had gone down there the second time, we had asked the church, what can we do for the church to bless the church? And they said, well, the kids in the community don't have anywhere to hang out on the weekends. They said it would be great to have a basketball court. So I told our 20, 30 college students that were going down with me, we're going to pour a basketball court where we're, while we're there. And so we get there. I've got about 25 or 30 unskilled laborers, but I show them how to frame up a court. We use the 3-4-5 rule to get a square corner to start with. And then I even get a line. We get it level. I show them how to screed concrete because now the concrete truck is coming and we've got tons of concrete d dumping out on us. And uh, about half an hour into it, and my concrete job is looking amazing, one of the college students comes up to me and he says, where did you learn to pour concrete? You know, where did you learn this? And I go, or he said, how did you learn this? And I go, I don't know. I thought about it. I said, I don't know. No one ever taught me. Later, as I thought about it, I realized that growing up since I was a kid, I watched my dad build about 50 buildings in Africa from the time I was in elementary school. And so when you're in the jungle, there's no entertainment, there's no YouTube, there's no TV, there's no video games. So when there was construction, we'd go sit for hours watching the guys do construction. So from second grade, third grade, seventh grade, high school, I watched my dad pour slabs. So maybe that's where I learned how to pour concrete with a little bit of confidence. And, and then also maybe that's why I'm a preacher today because... Every time we came back to America for six or nine months, my parents would go to about 60 different churches, and my dad would preach, and I would sit through sermon after sermon, sometimes the same sermon three times a week. In fact, when I was in third grade, we'd be riding back home from like Mobile, Alabama or Macon, Georgia, and we would, my brother and I would recite my, my dad's entire sermon to him word for word. Not me. He would go, how would you know? We wouldn't even get his pauses down for, for effect. <laughs> He said, how did you know that? I said, well, we've heard the thing like 38 times now. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm a preacher. I watched my dad build colleges, three colleges. Maybe that's, that's why I felt I was able to start a college. 
just finishing the slab pouring event. By the way, we got to the last, it's like 100 feet long, a basketball court. We're pouring the last slab, and then the rain. It started to rain and dump and ruin the entire job. We had to turn on car headlights to keep trying to shine the cement until about 11 o'clock at night. Kind of messed up my job. It did look fine for a minute. But here's what, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Do you see that? He's saying, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And that's what happens when we have the influence of godly people around us. You look at Peter, and he sees Jesus walking on the water. And so what does Peter say? Hey, if you can walk on the water, let me come walk on the water too. He's learning just because of his nearness to Christ. We had a, a woman on our staff, and she told me about a Bible study she was leading in, in, in a home. And she said that as one, one morning when the women were sharing about their week and they were getting started, one of the women shared that her father had suddenly died that week. And, and she wasn't ready for his death. He was young, and it was a complete shock. And she was devastated. As she's starting to tell them about her father, she starts to weep and cry and just keeps bawling. And so um, this member of our staff said, well, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know what I should say. I didn't know how I should react. And, and I'm sitting there kind of frozen, not sure, sure how to handle this woman who's just weeping in pain and agony because her, her father has just died. She said, just then, a godly woman in the group got up, walked across the living room, and she knelt down on her knees on the carpet right at the couch where the woman is sitting, and she wraps her arms around her. And she said, now I know what to do when someone is going through something tragic. You just need to hold them. You don't have to say anything. You just need to be there. And what is it? She learned by watching someone else. That's why I say the people around us shape us spiritually when we do life together. All right, here's, here's the next thought as we talk about in what ways do we grow spiritually when we come together? How does this happen? And I want to say we grow as we go, as we serve, as we do things after God together. Let's go back to our text, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And we read, they followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praise God. So you don't have to read far into Acts to see that this New Testament church was thriving because of what's called their shared experience. The things that they are doing together is shaping their spirituality. And so I want to remind you this morning that you, we grow spiritually when we share experiences with God's people, when we do something with others together. Certain experiences, experiences I'm convinced that certain experiences have power to shape us and even transform us spiritually. I think those experiences are even more powerful when we do them as a tribe, when we do them with people around us that are close to us. I've seen this happen my whole life in ministry. Uh, for example, I, I read a Wheaton College study. They had, they had done a survey of students who had graduated five years. They were five years out of college. And they asked them, one of the questions was, what influenced you spiritually? What shaped you spiritually the most over your four years at Wheaton College? And the overwhelming number one answer was not the Bible theology classes, it, it, the number one answer wasn't the chapel services that shaped them spiritually. It wasn't even the, the church down the street with a college ministry. It wasn't that. The number, their number one answer was what shaped me spiritually the most at Wheaton College was going to serve Christ with a missions team. It was either locally in Chicago or globally to places like Honduras or Haiti. They said those experiences, students wrote, are the things that shaped us. Do you see what I mean? That, that our experience, our shared experiences with others shape us spiritually. One of those Wheaton College students, her name is Gretchen. Gretchen was in my college ministry. She went to Honduras one summer for two months. And while she's there, uh, she, she sees the poverty. For two months, she's living in... Can we EQ this, guys? Um, for... 
for two months she's living in poverty, and it's and so she comes home and she's changed. Something has happened, and so she tells her parents. She says the house that you're living in is too big. She tells them that. She says my older brother's at college. I'm at college. You don't need a five bedroom house anymore. You don't need 4,000 square feet. It's too much house. There, there's too much poverty in the world for you to live in this. So the parents sold the house and moved into a condo by the train tracks. I watched this happen. I knew the family well. I, I had another student. His name is Paul Duncan. Uh, Paul Duncan was a musician. We went to Cuba together. We had about, I think there were 21 of us that went to Cuba. And we had the most incredible week watching God work miracle after miracle. Uh, watching people, dozens of people come to Christ at the events that we held. And I didn't know how that was affecting our college students from Wheaton, but as we're on the plane flying back, Paul Gunther, I'm sorry, Paul Duncan, I didn't know Paul Gunther then, Paul Duncan leaned across the aisle to me, says Palmer, he said, this is the first time in my life that I watch God in heaven step down and get involved in the life of Paul Duncan. And Paul Duncan, since then, I think that was a pivotal moment in his life because when he graduated from college, he became a worship pastor and then became a songwriter. Today, many consider Paul one of the most gifted and one of the leading songwriters in the country today. I think that started on a missions trip to Haiti. Uh, so my point here is that increasingly, educators and Christian educators are giving weight and validity to the fact that we grow through the experiences that we share with others. It's called, I have this on the screen, it's called experiential learning. And then let's go to the next slide. And I have here that shared experiences have the power to change and transform us. I hope you see that, that as we serve and do things with others, there's something that happens inside of us. The shared experience matters. I'll end with this. In May, I had the privilege of going to Rocky Point, Mexico. And in Rocky Point, Mexico, we got to, to serve in the community. We, some of the guys were helping to, to build a women's shelter. And so we spent three days serving. And then we spent nights and mornings on the beach studying the Bible and talking about leadership. And at the end of those three days, there was like, I think it was like six or seven or eight men that asked to be baptized. And it was this powerful moment of hearing them talk about the change that had happened in their life. Many of them through the, the relationships that they had here at the Grove. But man after man talking about addictions they had overcome or challenges in their life they had overcome. But they, it had happened because of the influence of the people around them. Experiences have power that we share with others, have power to change us. There's one final challenge I, I, I want to share with you this morning, and it's this. That the environment that we create shapes us spiritually. I have here, we are shaped by our spiritual ecosystem, all right? And maybe you've never heard of an ecosystem talked about in church before, but, but I think it works. All right, so in Acts chapter 2, we read this. Everyone, this is verse 43, everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. Can you, do you sense that there's this spiritual ecosystem that it formed? And all of their needs and all, all of uh, the family's needs were being met by each other. I think the same thing happens today, that God puts us in community so that we meet the needs both physically and spiritually of each other. We all know, for example, that trees and plants only thrive in the right ecosystem. That, that's one of the reasons we named this church The Grove, because trees thrive in a grove. Maybe you've heard me talk about this. But, for example, trees in a grove, they protect each other from the, uh, from the heat when it's 115 degrees out like it was yesterday. 
trees in a grove protect each other when there's a storm. Uh, we had, about two years ago, we had this massive haboob or monsoon that came through. I woke up in the morning. There must have been 100 trees down in our neighborhood. And I'm thinking, oh, man, half the grove is going to be down. And I got here, and not one branch was broken because trees in a grove protect themselves. Do you know this, that when trees drop their leaves, of course, they decompose and they create fertilizer. Tr tr trees also, when, in a grove, when they drop their leaves, it keeps the weeds from coming up. There's a sermon right there. And, and then, to get even better, maybe you already know this, but if you want pistachios or if you want your trees to multiply, you can't have one pistachio trees. It takes at least two or more to create a, a grove that is producing fruit. I think it's, I say a lot to say, it's the same with us spiritually. One of the things, and the point is that we thrive spiritually when we do this life together, when we're in the right ecosystem, to use the language I'm using. At the Grove, we've always banned fake plants and flowers, all right? There's just something plastic and fake about fake plants and flowers. And it's true with us spiritually as well. We as people don't want anyone to know if we, that we are fake or not authentic. And one of the things that happens when you have the right environment and the right, the right ecology is that we can be real and honest with each other. We grow in an, an environment of authenticity and honesty. I want to kind of illustrate this for you. I have a few circles, uh, a few illustrations I want to put on the screen. So all of us have what we'll describe as the real you, the you that was born, that God created. And when you were born, you were perfect in every way. Here's how David says it in Psalms. He says, I give you thanks because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. That's how the NIV, NASB says it. That's you. That's your life when you were born. I was, this verse reminded me of this fact that, that when you are born, you are perfect and good in every way. Because just three days ago, my son Byron and our daughter-in-law Christine had their second baby. I have to put her picture on the screen here. This is Abigail Rose, Abigail Rose Chinchin. Thank you for applauding that. I'm just a proud Proud grandfather right now and grandma there. Uh, but that's exciting. But it reminds you that when we are born, you, you were like that perfectly and awesomely made. But then something happens. It's usually in elementary school or it could be in junior high school. Maybe it's high school. Maybe it's later in life. But something happens that creates shame in our lives. Almost every person on earth. And, and, I, and this shame is there. We usually hide it, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades. But all of us have it there. If I were to ask you this, could you think back to when you were in elementary school or when you were in junior high, maybe it was when you were a young adult or in high school or college, but did something happen that created shame in your life? Think about that for a second. Can, can you remember the place and the time when that happened. You can, most of us can put our finger on the moment. We know what happened. Somebody mocked you or ridiculed you. Somebody made you feel very small and inadequate. And you've carried that around with you. You've, you've buried it. You've tried to forget about it. Maybe it will take you a minute to remember when that moment was. But it's there for all of us. And most of us don't want to talk about those things that we're ashamed of. We usually just try to hide them. I, I know that most of us can put our finger on the moment because I know my moment that, that created the shame in my life that stayed with me for decades. When I, uh, when I was in eighth grade, our family moved to a town where there was an international school in Liberia. And I had been homeschooled up to then. And when you're homeschooled, I'm just going to warn you, when, if your mom's not there, my mom was out running a, a clinic. Uh, my brother and I, we just taught ourselves. And, and when you're in like fourth grade, fifth grade, and you're supposed to teach yourself, you don't learn a whole lot. I'm just going to be straight and honest with you. And so, and, and so I had been teaching myself school till I get to about eighth, till I get to eighth grade. I get to eighth grade, and, and we go to this international school, and they've divided the school into what are called vernaculars. So there was that, you, in other words, you, you study in your own language. So there was the Spanish vernacular, there was a Swedish vernacular, tons of Swedes at this school, there was a Liberian vernacular, there's a German vernacular, 
but there was no American vernacular. So the, the principal didn't know what to do with me and my brother when we arrived. So he said, all right, I'm going to put you in the British vernacular. They think that's our people. So he put us in with the British. But the British don't want us. I, I'm just going to tell you that right now. The, the British are still salty that they lost the war in, 19, in 17, 1776, all right? They're still angry about that. And so they put us in with the British. The British kids just mocked us, which I could deal with. I was fine with that. But I could tell what really started to hurt was I could tell my teacher didn't want me there. And when your teacher doesn't want you there, you feel like, man, I, I, I don't want to show up in the morning. And there was one day when... When I was doing math, and I was terrible at math, I was, I was never at the top of my class. Um, I don't know if I was at the bottom of my class, but I was really bad at math. You can't teach yourself math, I've realized, in fifth and sixth grade. And so I had, she had asked us when we finished this math assignment, it was in a workbook, to bring it up to her desk. And I brought my math book up to her desk, and as she's looking at the room, she goes, wrong, wrong. And she has this red pen, and she's putting an X, bam, and she's hitting the desk each time and saying it wrong. I mean, the, the whole class could hear her saying this. And my neck is starting to burn. I can feel I'm turning red. My ears are on fire because I'm so embarrassed. I'm so full of shame because I can't do the math. And so I, I'm standing at her desk. I'm like, I, I can't take this anymore. And so I just started to walk away with my head down. And she's still grading going, wrong, wrong, wrong. And she must have gotten to the end because all of a sudden I heard and then felt a book fly and hit me in the back like that. And uh, I sat at my desk and I just left it on the ground. And I felt the shame. I sat there the whole class. And I, and, and I felt as small as that book did on the ground. I, I felt about this big. And I wanted to run away, but where am I going to go? And that shame, it stays with you for a long time. You, you feel for years like you're an inadequate. In fact, you feel dumb and stupid after that. And, and if you think about your own life, I'm sure, I'm certain you can put your finger on those moments that created shame in you. And maybe you've held on for them to, for too long. And you know, what, do you, you know what we do as human beings when we feel that shame? We try to hide it. We don't think we can solve it. So I'm going to put one more circle up. And this one says the false self. So we put up a facade to try to hide that shame. That whatever is inadequate ab about us. Maybe you didn't do well in school, so you became the class clown. Because that's a way to get attention in a positive way. Or maybe you started to pr pursue a sport. Because you felt if I could pursue in this, people will like me because I'm a great athlete. Uh, or, or maybe you took up an instrument and became a musician because you felt inadequate in one area. You thought, well, if I become this this great accomplished musician or artist, then people will like me because of that. And, and that just doesn't happen in high school or college. It, can, it follows us into adulthood. We think, well, if I can get the right job title, then people will respect me and we can bury that shame. Or if I earn enough money and I have uh, enough, uh, the right, if I can buy the right car, the right house, then maybe that shame will go away. The outer ring that I have here, the false self, it's just theater, isn't it? It's just a mask that you put on. It's a facade. You're pretending that life is better and more glamorous than it is. You have something buried that you're trying to hide. This is why God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, why are you hiding? And they're hiding because of their shame. I know I hid my shame for a long time, well into my 20s and into my 30s. I, I, I know that because when I finished high school, I went to college. I did okay in college. I signed up immediately for a master's degree. And, and then I finished one master's, so I immediately signed up for a second master's degree. And, and then after that, I, before I could even finish that one, I signed up for a Ph.D. program. And seven years later, I had a Ph.D. in education. And after I finished my Ph.D., and I've reflected on this, I think many times maybe I kept trying to get an education and get a doctor in front of my name so it would erase the shame of Mrs. Best throwing a workbook at me. And the truth is, we all do this. And I want to say this morning that you don't have to. 
This is, if you've been pretending that things are better than they are, if you've been putting on a facade, if you've had this theater of your outer life, that's not you. That's not the real you. You don't have to do that anymore. That's why the grove is here. God has an answer to our shame and our inadequacies that we feel. And it's called community that is Christian. He calls us to gather with people who won't shame us, people who will honor you and celebrate you and walk through those struggles with you and help you overcome those shortcomings and those inadequacies. And so I, I share all that just to say you don't have to hide anymore. This is why the church, this church is here. This is why the Grove is here. We want the Grove, we want every one of our life groups, our gatherings of the Grove to be places of honesty and vulnerability where, where you don't have to hide your shame, where you can be celebrated, the, the good and beautiful person who God made you to be. I, I want to invite you to take a very practical step while Josh shares this song with us. So don't get up from your seat. Take a minute. We have this card that says life groups at the top. These life groups, I really, be, I, I use this language our first week. I said these groups will be life-giving. If you felt like you have been hiding things on the inside, if you felt like you've been dying on the inside, these life groups will be life-giving. I can guarantee you that. And so would you pray about and think about filling this out and then joining up, connecting with people who live in Phoenix and Ahwatukee or Tempe or Scottsdale or Gilbert or Mesa or Queen Creek or, or East Mesa or Chandler or Maricopa, wherever it is, we want you to gather. Maybe find people who have similar passions. You can write that on here. We'll connect you. Or maybe find people who are at the same life stage as you and connect with them. But the entire invitation is this. You don't have to do this life after God alone anymore. And you will thrive. If you give yourself to gathering at the Grove, you will thrive. You will flourish. You will see all the good and beautiful things that God has for you.